blind, but now I see. Let me tell you, I can think back on life and painfully remember what life was like before I truly knew Jesus. Let me tell you something. I heard somebody say, oh, my Lord. (laughs) Amen, sister. I was truly blind. For those of you who are visiting for the first time today, it's such an honor and privilege to be here. I'm Pastor Mike, and crazy to think I've been uh, the opportunity to be an associate pastor here for 25 years, soon to be able to be associate pastor for my brother as I faithfully served bishop, and uh, pastor, thank you for the honor of being able to speak today. I'm glad you're joining with us online today. Maybe it's your first time. If so, we're so glad you could be here. Uh, It's a great day. We're celebrating Pentecost. You know, it's not something that we normally talk about in in Kingdom Life because we don't necessarily follow a church calendar. And, And I can't even tell you that we set this up, did we, Pastor Marco? This was just, God, what are you saying to us? And I'm telling you what he's saying to us is, I have created this place to be not only the storehouse of my power, but the place my power pours out of. But God doesn't pour out just randomly. He chooses to pour his power out through us. And so last week, if you were here, if you watched online, uh, Pastor Marco began and he brought a message uh, called uh, Desperately Seeking. And he brought this scripture, and I've meditated on this scripture and meditated all week. It's 1 Corinthians 4.10. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And I can't tell you how many times we've made this conversation about God's power a matter of talk. But God's doing something. He's doing something here in this church. He's doing something in your lives. He desires to do something in your life. But it's not just here. You're beginning to see and sense there's a swell of the activity of God. Where the darkness grows dark, the light shines brightest. And I am telling you, don't look at the darkness in fear. Look at it and shout for joy because the greater the darkness, the greater God's power shines. Thank you, Jesus. Shoot. Last week, Pastor Marco used this word desperate desperately seeking and that goes against our natural inclination right because we don't want to be looked at as desperate we 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 want to be looked at as people who have it all together but if we walk away from we understand that the only way we're ever going to truly know God's presence is if we strip off all of our own sense of understanding say God you got to dump something new you got to put a new understanding in God. I need to figure out how to get what's in here that doesn't belong out so you can pour more into me. And I'm desperate for that. And I want to introduce a new word today. And it's called dependent. My message today is dependently acting. Because here's the deal. You can desperately seek and get information. You can desperately seek and get the information you need. But if you don't act with it, it does nothing for you. But the problem is so often we've had a piece of information and we've acted out of it with our own strength and we wonder why we fall flat. And the reason is because to understand the power of God truly, you have to understand where dependency lies. And I'm gonna bring it round through in the end, but our message today is dependently acting. And how many of you know that you can learn a lesson a couple of different ways, right? Right, you can learn a lesson by going to school and hopefully you go to school and you, you learn your history, you learn, you know, you, you learn a subject. Uh, you can learn um, uh, uh, from, from uh, experience. Anybody here ever learn lessons by experience? 
How many have ever learned a lesson by experience and really learned it? How many have ever learned a lesson by experience but took a little time to learn it? Amen. Bishop, thank you for 32 years of grace letting me learn lessons at your expense over and over and over again. I'm grateful to think that I finally learned a few. But the reality of it is, so often the best way to learn, some say it's by making mistakes, I'd like to think that sometimes the best way to learn is actually from other people's mistakes. Sometimes if somebody else has been dumb enough to make the decision and to make the, you know, make the choice, you can learn from what they did wrong, Right? Is it easier to watch somebody, not, not that you want to gloat in what they've done wrong, but realize, ooh, I probably shouldn't do that, right? You know, it's funny because with your kids, you're constantly, you know, trying to help them because as a parent, you know the mistakes you've made, right? You know where you've really blown it, and you don't want your kids to make the same mistakes. And hopefully with God's grace, my kids will be better than me, but how many of us know we heard our parents say, don't do it, don't, don't uh, uh, ah. now you learned. Today we get to turn to a fun scripture. Anybody want to hear a fun scripture? You know, the Bible, I love the Bible. I love to study it. If you get around me, you know, it's one of my favorite things to talk. And, and, uh, and uh, I love getting together with Minister Lee and Pastor Marco and just punching back and forth and what a scripture means. Uh, but every once in a while, there's this story that will jump out at you. And today we're going to go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 19, Acts 19. And in verse 11, you know, while you're going there, we learn from others' mistakes. You know, a couple of things like I think of as you're going there, like dating, right? I, I, I do pre-marriage counseling. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a couple and said, ooh, you don't want to do that. Or even better yet, in church, right? Oh, gosh, here's a groaner, right? How many people came, oh, I got this great scheme. It's a multi-level marketing, but it's not what you think it is. I'm really going to make a lot of money. And I go, please learn from everybody else's mistakes. If you do make money, it's because you lose your friends. If you want to have friends, you won't make money. <laughs> Bottom line. Okay, are you there? Okay, here's a fun story. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know. I know about Paul, but who are you? I love this responsive reading. This is great. Keep it up. <laughs> then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scroll, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it is more than just stories. We thank you it is more than just formulas. It is your way of pointing us to hope. That from beginning of this book to the end, you have pointed out the value you have created us with and your desire to have relationship with us. You showed us how we could be free from the tyranny of sin, which keeps us bound. Lord, today, may your word go forward and break the bondage of sin, that we would be free to know your power, not for us, but for a world that desperately needs you. 
We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesus. So let's talk about the city of Ephesus for just a moment. So Ephesus is off, it's, uh, if you look on a map, it would have been up near Turkey, actually in Turkey, right on the coast. Ephesus was known uh, for being the center of magic for the, 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 the Middle East and Asia. Everybody know that the best magicians, the, the, the best spell casters were all in Ephesus. Matter of fact, in Ephesus, they had the temple to Artemis, or Artemis was also known as Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was considered one of the most beautiful buildings uh, ever known to man. Uh, one of the writers said, even the sun's brilliance did not match the beauty of the temple of Artemis. And so in this town, they were known for their craftsmen. And you'll find, if we read the story further, which we're not going to today, you're going to find that they were silversmiths, and, and they were skilled at making idols. But also they were those, this, this, uh, this uh, magicians, and they had all kinds of spells that they would create. They were known for, uh, it was called uh, the Ephesian letters, or the grammata. This is not to be confused with the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote which is interesting if you really tease it out, but I can't geek out in Scripture right now. Um, but the Ephesian letters were these six characters, or six words that were supposedly so magical, you, you, you had to be an expert and you had to be highly skilled and trained to use them. And so the people of Ephesus would, would, would constantly uh, looking to understand the magic, the, the, the mysteries uh, of everything. And so, so from all over the place, you would have magicians that would come in to learn, or you would have these traveling uh, magicians and traveling exorcists who would come in. And so it was this crazy easy, uh, you know, deeply spiritual place. And in the middle of that, we find Paul. If you'd gone back a few verses earlier, we find that Paul now has actually been in Ephesus. And he's there and he's preaching and teaching. It's about two and a half years that he's preaching and teaching as he comes up to the point to where this story is. And people are coming in from everywhere to hear us. And not only is he preaching and teaching... But it said God is using him, right? What does it say? In extraordinary, unusual miracles. Now, think about that for just a moment. How many of you have ever witnessed a miracle? Wide open question. A couple of people. I, I've, I've witnessed one. Pastor Marco and I were a witness to a miracle. Walked in, I've told this story. Walked into a hospital room. Doctor said, young lady's probably not going to make it through the night. They asked us to come to do last rites. We walked in, and I just said, wow, that, that bar is really high, and just said, Lord, they've set the bar high. Heal her. I didn't know what else to pray. Lord Jesus, you have to heal her. We walked out of there. The next morning, she had been on, she had been on a ventilator for, I don't know, 10 days, full 100% oxygen. They could not figure out what was wrong. Bottom line, three days later, she walked out of the hospital. I've seen it. Would you agree that that would be unusual? But it's interesting, it says that God worked unusual miracles in, through Paul. So that means that by context, if you study the word, that meant there were miracles that were commonplace. So miracles were kind of commonplace, but there's something unusual happening here. Why is this important? Because you're in a culture where people are kind of already expecting. They're watching these, uh, these people come and casting spells. And, and they see them doing these kinds of acts. And it says that they took uh, the, the, the handkerchiefs and aprons. And if you actually go and you spend any time reading, it's really the, the, the literal translation is sweat rags. They took the sweat rags that Paul had from around his, uh, his head or that touched his skin. His apron, anything that touched him. It says they were bringing it to people and they were getting healed. Now listen. I don't know how many of y'all have ever seen on TV. You just send your $5 gift. You send any gift, and we're going to send you this handkerchief. And you lay it on them, you're going to get healed. Okay, so let me just tell you, if you haven't figured it out already, learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> Keep your money, because it ain't going to do you no good. Because even in the scripture, that was looked at as unusual. But it's interesting that God would do it that way. Why? Because in these people's minds, 
That was a way that they kind of understood. There's something going on here. And God was able to use that. But you know what it says here? Guess what it says? Didn't heal people. Didn't say the handkerchief healed them. Didn't say that Paul healed them. It says that God healed them through this process. But when somebody comes to you and goes, hey, listen, I got a rag and I've touched it and and you just do it, guess what's going to happen? It is not about the healer. It is about the person who is hawking the goods. God worked in unusual ways. Why do you think people needed spells? Why do you think they were so focused on idols and things like that? What do you think they were looking to get out of it? Well, you know, how many times are people looking for comfort in their lives? They're looking for power. They're looking for for love and how many, you know, love potion number nine, right? (laughs) That's all I will sing. We value the speakers. We value your ears, right? Potions, right? Uh, How many of you have ever wished you could just wave a magic wand and life would be so much better? That's what they lived for. They live to have any kind of spells to be able to get power, to be able to get love, to make life more comfortable, to be more prestigious. And yet Paul comes into the middle of this and he's not promoting himself. It says that he spends the days in the hall of Tyrannus teaching from 11 to 4. He's in this place and he's schooling people for two, two and a half years. But in this process, people are getting healed The gospel's going forward and lives are being changed so much so that it's unusual. So what do we find? In verse 13, we come upon these guys. Now listen, the seven sons of Sceva, it says they were what? Jewish, the sons of Jewish priests, okay? Sons of Jewish chief priests. Well, just so you know, a little interesting fact, uh, uh, Sceva would have been a Latin name, not a Jewish name. So chances are these guys were just these itinerant hucksters who are coming together and they're looking to make a buck. But it's interesting. It says that they've been doing this. They've been working as exorcists. So somehow there's something going on where they have a little measure of success. Why? Because for the most part, when you're looking at people who think they're demon possessed, it's not so much possession as much as there's maybe mental illness or there's things going on. But listen to me carefully. Just because there is mental illness, that doesn't mean the devil doesn't work. Just because there may be a more rational experience to explain, doesn't mean that there can't be a spiritual presence going on too, right? We want the power of the Holy Spirit to fall, but yet at the same time, we deny the power of the devil. Like, oh yeah, well, you know, that's not really the devil. That's just kind of like bad pizza. I grew up in a culture of church in my early days where uh, exorcism was like just a standard part of service. Like service ended, altar call came, buckets came out, towels came out. Okay, we're going to lay. What's your problem? Uh, I got a headache. Oh! Come out, you spirit of pain! Cough deeply three times, brother. There it is! The spirit's coming out of him. Now listen, I... I you know, there were some real deeply wonderful, faithful people but all that, that, that were just really misguided. But I'm also going to tell you something that these guys figured out. They were, they, were, they were messing around, making money until they came upon the real thing. And sometimes in life, we go through our church messing around with the God game, but very ill-equipped when the real thing gets sat in front of us. So what do these guys do? Spirit, we cast you out in the name of the guy that Paul preaches about Jesus. Why? So remember I talked about this uh, this, uh, Ephesian letters? So what they understood, Plutarch, the historian, wrote this. Plutarch was uh, around 50 uh, AD. He was a historian. He was also a a, a priest in in one of the temples. Um, uh, And and he writes in here about this this, uh, six-word thing and and how the the exorcist would, uh, you could pay this great deal of money, and an exorcist would teach you this formula for saying these words. And if you said these words just right over and over and over and over and over again, you could be free from 
from whatever ails you. And so that's how they're making their money. But these guys notice they're making their money doing this all of a sudden, but they realize that there's a power going on with this Paul guy that, wait a minute, that's even better than what we got. So even in the middle of their mess, they're realizing, wait a minute, there is a power that's greater than the power that we have. So what do you think they do? They're like, hey, let's try it out. Let's add that on. So, you know, the idea would have been, hey, here's here's your formula, but also we're going to add on the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Well, the problem is knowing the name of Jesus doesn't mean a whole lot. It's only when you're known by him and you're in his authority that it makes any kind of difference. So for instance, if you're an ambassador, right? And, 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 and you walk into, let's say I, 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 I you know, walk into uh, you know, the Russian embassy. Let's say I walk into the Russian embassy. And I go, okay, hey, listen, you tell Mr. Putin I'm American. And he better back off. Y'all love me? Do y'all, do y'all think I have some measure of responsibility and authority as your shepherd? You think if I went into the Russian embassy, it would make a lick of difference? No, because I ain't sent by our government to deal with another government. But see, the problem is there's so many people that come to church, but they don't understand what it means to be sent as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And so they walk with a lot of words, but very little authority. They invoke the name of Jesus and wonder why they keep getting a beat down every time they turn around. Some of you have been coming to church forever. Some of you have worked hard to memorize scripture and you wonder why you keep getting a beat down because there's something missing. You become dependent on your knowledge. You become dependent on your tithing. You become dependent on being a good person. You become dependent on what you think about God, but you've not been dependent on him. And so you don't walk in his authority. You can't invoke the name of God by secondhand inference. You can't say in the name of Jesus who Bishop preaches and the name of Jesus who Pastor Marco talks about in the name of Jesus they talk about in my church in the name of Jesus who is my Lord and Savior. I tell you in Jesus' name, get out of my life. And it says the devil has to flee. You know why? Greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. But if you're in the world and he isn't in you, you can say his name all day long and it'll make a lick of difference. Playing games with God will get you a beat down. That's what these guys were doing. Matter of fact, if you go to the message version of the Bible, I love how it says it. It said, they, the sons of Sceva, saw Paul's game and wanted in on it. Okay? So here they go. They're in there, and they're making a mess of things. We get over to verse 17. Oh, he says this in verse 17. For, so they, they got beat up, they left. Let's go on. When it became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. What is the second commandment? Anybody know? Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. And so we grew up with, oh my God. If I ever said, oh my God, I mean, I would have gotten a back slap. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. I remember going with a family, some friends of ours, to uh, Ireland, and uh, it, was, it was interesting because uh, his dad over there, you know, every time he turned around, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, you know, I mean, that was, that was cussing for him. I mean, he was hardcore cussing. I'm thinking, ooh, I'm stepping a couple of feet back from this guy. I can get lightning bolts hit me. Because we're thinking about taking the Lord's name in vain as, you know, oops, letting it slip out as a cuss. Now listen, I'm not going to say that it's not, but if that's all you think taking the Lord's name in vain is, you are woefully mistaken. Because whenever we seek to operate and we use the name of Jesus to do our own thing, we're taking the Lord's name in vain. And how many times have we done something, oh, the Lord told me to do this for you. No, you did that to get somebody's knowledge. How many times have I, I sat and I've watched some people, and I, I think most of them meant really well, but going to go out and they're going to give a prophecy in the Lord's name, and you sit there and it's all said at the end of the day. It's like, come on, really? 
Thus not saith God, thus saith you. You never see this any greater time than in a season of politics. How many prophets are out there using the Lord's name in vain, speaking things God doesn't say, and I'm just going to tell you, don't get trapped in that mess because they take the Lord's name in vain. Taking the Lord's name is when we don't understand the authority, the relevance, the awe with which the name of God means. You know, I can live my life taking the Lord's name in vain. You see, when you call yourself a Christian, but you live like the world, you take the Lord's name in vain. God is looking for a change. He's looking for something new. You know what happens? It says these people then began to believe, verse 18, listen to this, this is crazy. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their deeds. Think about that for just a moment. He's been preaching for two and a half years. Those who believed are only now coming out because they saw, by the way, not that Paul did something, but the power of God did something because somebody used it the wrong way. And everybody's like, whoa, I ain't touching that one. All of a sudden, there's something that changes. There's something, there's power. I can't just invoke this name anymore. It's got something. And now there's this awesome fear that sets in place. And they begin to come out. What's the interesting thing about that? It says they, they, they begin to confess openly. Now, here's the fascinating thing, if you understand what's going on here. So remember I told you that they, they would have these spells, right? And they would pay for these spells. But guess how the spell worked? It only worked if it was a secret you kept. So there was a period of, of my life before I became a pastor and I did children's entertainment. And um, I decided I was going to add uh, magic into what I do. And so I went down to the local magic shop and, uh, you know, they have all these tricks. And this, the guy behind the counter is amazing. He's doing these tricks and I'm just watching him absolutely baffled at how he does it. He's like, okay, you want to learn this trick? Yeah, I want to learn. I mean, it's like amazing. It's like a hundred bucks. All right, a hundred bucks. You know what I got? Two silk scarves and a plastic thumb. And instructions how to use them. But here it went with it. Don't you dare share this secret with anyone else. Because if anybody else knows what you're doing, the magic's going to be lost. They're not going to believe what you're doing. They're going to be like, oh, that's stupid. I know how to do that. See, it was the same thing. The power of the spell that people thought was as long as I'm the only one who knows it, it has power. Not realizing that same huckster is selling that same, that same formula to everybody else down the street. But as long as we keep it secret, it's got power. But here's the thing, all of a sudden when real power shows up, something changes in their heart. And you know what they begin to do? They begin to pour out the secrets. And some of us have been carrying secrets in our hearts and they're giving you power, but it's the power to kill you, not to bring life. Some of you are holding deep secrets of unforgiveness. Some of you are holding deep secrets of sin that you've caused. Some of you are carrying things and everything looks good because sometimes our secrets medicate us. Sometimes that bottle is a secret nobody knows about, but it's what I need to get through my day. It's what I'm dependent on. Some of you will abuse another because you need the feeling of power. But if everybody really knew deep down inside you're scared, the secret would be lost. But when the power of God hits and you see it, the first thing they begin to do is pour out their secrets. And some of us have carried secrets for too long and you'll never understand the power of God to change your life as long as you're holding on to the secrets that you think are bringing you comfort. But it goes a step farther than that because in verse 19 we find this. And a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Again, two and a half years, Paul's preaching. 
Some of these people held on to their scrolls and maybe they didn't use them anymore, but they couldn't let them go. You know why? Because they spent too much money. Well, you know, I don't believe it anymore, but I'm not necessarily going to get it go. Do you know how much I paid for that? Huh. Some of us have remnants of our life that we keep in our closet, not because we think it's controlling us anymore, but because we spent too much money to let it go. Some of you have relationships you're keeping hidden in the background just in case. You'll never know life moving forward if you're still holding on to things that are behind you. But when we've invested in the world, then the world gets a hold of us. And it doesn't want to let go, but you're never going to know the power of Jesus flowing through you just by seeking him if you're still holding on to the past. That's why Paul says over in, in Philippians 3, which Pastor Marco so beautifully pointed out, when he says, listen, I want to know him. I want to know him in the, the pain of his suffering that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. All these things which I've had, I count them all as rubbish. I let them all go. Why? Because I'm pressing forward, letting go of what is behind. I press forward forward to the mark, but you can't press forward to the mark holding on to the things that are from your past. And it says not only did they begin to let the secrets spill out, but they took those things which they held that once brought them comfort, that they'd invested so much in that they were afraid to let it go all of a sudden. Nothing means more anymore. Take it. Do you know what 50,000 drachma equated to? Somewhere between five and six million dollars. Five and six million dollars worth of stupid idols and scrolls and magic things which meant nothing, but people held on to them. But in this moment, they realized that when the power of God hits and when his power is real, it's the only thing that changes my life. And the things they were once dependent on, they begin to let go of. And as they let go, freedom comes. Huh. See, the devil does not need to possess you if he can keep you possessing your possessions. I'll say it again. The devil does not need to possess you. He doesn't need to send a demon to possess you if you're so busy holding on to your possessions. But the moment you learn to live with an open hand, say, Lord Jesus, I want to experience what it means to live fully dependent on you. No more secrets. No more props. Then we begin to find the power of the Holy Spirit. If you look through history, you're going to find something. If you look through history of the church... So often right now you're hearing so many people talking and praying and God, we want revival. God, send us your Holy Spirit to bring revival. But I'm going to tell you, there is not one single revival movement that's happened in the history of the church that didn't start first with repentance. It's only when we shift our dependence from our secrets, our prestige, our sense of acceptance, our identity, our nationality. When it's only when we let go of these things, our, 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 our wealth. It's when we let go of these things and we lay ourselves open that then we transfer our dependence over to God. But you know you'll see something else? Listen to me carefully. Nowhere in here does it say they all went to meet with Paul privately to burn their scrolls. It says, together they publicly laid their mess and burned it. And I'm going to tell you something. Until the church of Jesus Christ, whether kingdom life or anywhere else, understands the power of corporate repentance and saying, God, these are the things which we have caused us to lose our focus. We'll never understand the full power of God flowing through his church. You may find it individually, but we're setting up a moment. We're calling for home fellowships, life groups. You know why? Not so we have another organization, another thing for our church to do but so that we can understand the power of vulnerability. 
laying ourselves open to one another that the Lord can come in, no longer dependent on our, uh, our, 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 our reputations, no longer dependent on those things that have propped us up, but reliant purely on Jesus Christ. Over in James, you'll find the scripture, James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins one to another. I'm going to read it to you. James says this. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Some of us have been coming up to altars and getting prayed for for a long, long time, but we've never confessed a thing. Others have confessed to God all day long, but you've never been with others that can hear and offer words of prayer over you. It says on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. That did not mean they were just all in one room. They had to be there for days processing through what they had done, abandoning Jesus, abandoning one another, doubting him. But they got to the place where they were finally in one accord as believers together, and the Holy Spirit fell. As we're coming here and we're talking today about Pentecost Sunday, what I'm telling you is this. God is looking to pour his power out on his people, but we have to be earnestly seeking and desperately acting, dependently acting. So my question for you is, as we begin to close now, what is it you're depending on? What are you depending on? Are you depending on your job? Because let me tell you, that can change in an instant. Are you depending on your health? Because I've prayed with some faithful people who have wondered, God, why? Are you depending on your reputation? Because anybody these days can say anything. Or sometimes we can make one dumb choice Are we depending on ourselves? Are we depending on, are we, are we holding manipulation with our secrets, giving everyone around us one picture of ourselves, but inside we're dying? What are you depending on for life? What are your secret incantations that you roll over and over in your mind? What are the memories you hold on to that give you power? If only I'd said this. And in that moment, we get a sense of power, but it still doesn't change what happened. If only I'd done this. I could have done this. I could have done that. I know. I was that guy. I held those memories for 31 years of abuse that I'd received. 31 years I held on to them. And I remember that's where I would go back and I would replay the memories of sitting in my attic, hiding, and going, man, I wish I had come out of the attic. I could have grabbed a frying pan. I could have, I could have, I could have done all these things. And, and that's what I would fuel on. But it didn't change the past. And it certainly didn't heal any relationships. But there came a point in time when I went. Some of you may have been here a Sunday many years ago when my dad was here. And I remember telling my dad, I forgive you. But would you forgive me for standing in judgment? And all of a sudden, those memories of pain, I still remember them. But you know what I call them now? I call them victory memories. I call them victory memories. Because when I stop rolling over the incantation of what I could have done, should have done, would have done, if I could have done, and said, I'm sorry for walking in judgment, Would you forgive me? It broke the power of that spell. And in that moment, I walked in freedom. And for those of you who know, I have a relationship with my dad I didn't have. He turned 78 yesterday. What are the incantations you roll over and over in your head? I wish I hadn't done this. If only I can gain this. If, if only I can work harder, make more than I can provide. What are the things that you're depending on? Because I'm telling you this, as you began to hear last week, you cannot seek Jesus and stuff. It's Jesus or nothing. But when we do, we will find 
the power of the Holy Spirit begin to pour out upon you and upon us. And that's all I want. I want to know him, including in the pain of his suffering, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Some of you feel like you're dying. I want to challenge you. Go all the way. Let go of the things that are killing you. Say, Lord Jesus, I've held on to this sense of identity, but I now want to live for you. Let go of the lies. But I'm going to tell you, when you bring it to somebody and you say, would you pray with me? The Bible says in James, you'll find healing. And as we begin to be whole and dependent on Jesus, when we begin to act dependently on him, we will know the power of his resurrection. And that's the hope of the gospel, that you can live, not just in eternity and in heaven, but you can know the fullness of life that he's promised. And then we, as believers and as a church, will be the hope that this world so desperately needs. Will you take the challenge to examine yourself and say, what are the things that I depend on more than Jesus? Then will you take the next step in these next days to begin to repent? Maybe for now you need to come. You know, Paul says it's, you know, says the handkerchiefs and apron, but that wasn't God's ultimate plan. That's just what he used in that moment to get their attention. But ultimately, it says the outcome of this story, you know what the outcome was in verse 20? It says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I want the word of the Lord to spread widely and grow in power. Would you join me with that? Let's stand. If you're watching online, I'm going to encourage you to stand right where you're at. Right now, I'm going to encourage you, look inside of yourself. Lord Jesus, what are the things that I hold on to more than I hold on to you? It's a scary prayer because the moment you say, God, I want to let him go, you don't get to play the game without the authority. But when you say, Jesus, I put myself in your hands, there's no more beat up. There's only life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my family. God, for those who are here for the first time or online for the first time, who may not even know you, Lord Jesus, I'm praying that there's something in here that sparks a hope that we can live no matter how lovely our life looks on the outside, that Lord, deep inside of us, we live with the same peace. Lord, I pray against the powers of darkness which keep us so wrapped up in our own minds and our own thinkings. And in Jesus' name, as a shepherd of these people, God, I speak freedom to those who are in bondage. For those who will be willing to shift allegiance to you, God, may they know power, your power, the power of peace, the power of joy in the middle of a storm, the power of hope in the middle of what seems to be depression. God, I pray it pour into their lives, not just so they'd feel better, but so that the world around us would know your power and your word and your name would grow in power and in spread. I pray blessing on my family today. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. Would you consider partnering with us to share the hope of God and the love of Jesus by giving? You can give your gift at klcc.us forward slash give. Thank you for your generosity. Also, we would love to connect with you. So please follow, like, and subscribe to all of our social media platforms, as well as downloading our app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. Be sure to turn on notifications so you never miss a thing. Thanks for watching and see you next time.